again this evening. Ephesians chapter number four. Ephesians chapter number four. Finishing what we began this morning. Uh, centered around the theme. Seven life changing words that will revolutionize your home. And uh, we asked a question uh, there in, uh, as we began. Is, is forgiving a normal part of your living? Is forgiving a normal part of your living? So as we began this series last week, we looked at the word love from a biblical perspective. And we made this statement over and over again in our message last week that love is more an action than it is an emotion. And so our word for this week, one of the words that has the life-changing ability to revolutionize your home, not only love, but forgiveness. Employing forgiveness in your home. Now listen, just as love is more an action than it is an emotion, forgiveness is an action and not a feeling. Forgiveness is an action and not a feeling. You see, forgiving families are truly living families. If you're going to grow in your walk with the Lord Jesus Christ and in your relationship with others, sometimes there are things that you just have to let go. You just have to give it up to God. Now, remember we said this this morning, that forgiveness does not mean that you weren't hurt. Forgiveness does not mean that the offense did not happen. Forgiveness does not mean that you're condoning what happened. Forgiveness does not even mean that you can forget what happened. Forgiveness means that you are being obedient to what Christ wants you to do as his child. So we, we looked in uh, Ephesians 4, we looked beginning in verse number 26. Stand as I read that this evening in honor and reverence to the word of God. <clears throat> Good looking Sunday night crowd, amen? Verse number 26, Paul said, Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands, the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication, no unwholesome words proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto its hearers. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Forgiveness in your home has the life changing ability to revolutionize it. Thank you, and you may be seated. May God add his blessings to the reading of his word. Uh, now, the first thing that we saw this morning, just by, just by way of uh, setting up where we are tonight, the first thing we saw this morning were these prohibitions in verses 26 through 31. They are prohibitions for the Christian home to examine. We're to examine these prohibitions, but we're also to examine our heart. And I told you this morning that I believe the Holy Spirit of God gave us these prohibitions as believers. He gave them to us in the context of forgiveness because He knows our nature. He knows human nature. We don't like to forgive. We don't want to forgive. We like to hold grudges. We like to resent folks. But these prohibitions can be directly applied to your family and to your life this evening. Notice what he said in verse 26. We just read it. He said, in your anger, don't sin. We don't have to sin when we get mad. We don't have to sin in our words, in our deeds, or in our actions. Then he said, in your anger, don't let the sun set. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. You forgive your mate or you stay up late. <laughs> You may have some late nights, but don't go to bed steaming in anger with that family member. In your anger, he says in verse 27, third of all, don't let the Satan set up shop. Give no place to the devil. The devil will get a foothold in your family if there's unresolved anger in it. So when you do get mad, and we all get mad, when you do get mad, don't let Satan set up shop in your heart and in your home. And then Paul says, uh, number four, he says, in your anger, watch your mouth. Boy, that's practical, amen? 
Watch your mouth. Not just in the home, but wherever you are. I was talking about my nieces and nephews a while, while ago. Listen, when we sat down for lunch, I, uh, some of them said something about that. Watch your mouth. And, and uh, we, I was looking at Taylor. He's, over, he's not my nephew. He just comes every Sunday. And you can get on to him next Sunday. But he says, that's hard for me. <laughs> and his boy, the ne- nephews who live with him said, we know. We know that's hard for you. I said, does he use filthy, foul language? And they said, he sure does. <laughs> In your anger, watch your mouth. And then Bennett, my nephew, sitting beside me, said, We all do, Stuart. <laughs> I said, I don't. Stacy does when she drinks, but I don't. <laughs> In your anger, watch your mouth. He says, No corrupt communication, unwholesome words. That which is bad, decayed, or rotten, foul words. Foul words will stink up your family. Then fifth of all, he says, in your anger, do not grieve God's Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is saddened when our anger erupts and when we use our words as weapons. And then number six, he says, in your anger, strip yourself of unchristlike attitudes and actions. Verse number 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Don't hold on to unholy things. This verse makes it very clear that we have a responsibility to throw away the stuff that's making a mess of our marriages, our homes, and our churches. So get rid of bitterness, get rid of rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. What do those words mean? Well, bitterness is simply bearing a grudge or a smoldering resentment. Ang- or rage uh, speaks of a blazing fire that explodes and consumes everything in its path. It's like the shrapnel of a bomb. Our words wound far and wide. Then he speaks of anger. Anger uh, here speaks of a deep resentment that smolders below the surface as it looks for an opportunity to erupt on somebody. It's like a volcano. Inside that mountain, that lava is smoldering. It's boiling until the time that it just erupts and destroys everything in its path. That's that's what anger will do to you. It'll smolder underneath the surface just waiting to erupt on somebody. It's a long-lasting and slow-burning anger that refuses to be pacified. And then uh, notice he uses the word clamor. That's brawling. Violent public outbursts or quarrelsome shouting, he says, should not be there. Throw it away. And then he talks about evil speakings. That's slander. Any word that we would use that calls into question the integrity and character of another. We need to be careful when we get on social media and we make insinuations about someone else. That is slander if we don't know it to be true. And listen, you've heard me say this before. Just because it is true doesn't mean we've got to talk about it. And then malice. Hatred that stems from a basic selfishness. Malice is the desire to injure another and to make them pay the price for causing us so much hurt. We hate them so much that we want to see them hurt as bad as we did. We hate them so much we want to see something bad happen. So we, we had some checkup questions this morning. Are any of these that we just mentioned lingering around in our hearts? I mean, even just a little bit. Just smoldering, waiting for a chance to erupt. How is your family functioning tonight? Are there some unchristlike habits in your home that are keeping it from functioning as it should? Is your family no longer functioning well because of some of these unholy habits? Paul says we're to get rid of them, which means to throw them away. The phrase actually means to put away or to let it go. It refers to lifting an anchor of a ship so that the ship could set sail. If we harbor these things in our heart, bitterness towards someone else, malice towards someone else, anger towards someone else, if we just live with that inside of us, we're just anchored like a ship would be anchored, not be able to move. If we harbor these things, we're anchored and we're not moving. We're not making any kind of uh, growth in our life. We're just stuck. And so we got real honest and personal this morning. We said something like this. Many of us don't want to let go of this garbage because we actually enjoy being vengeful and bitter. We like watching our spouse squirm. We enjoy belittling our kids. We like to pile on our parents. We like to hold a secret grudge in the church. Some of us want people to come crawling back to us. 
prohibitions to examine. And I'll tell you what, I really had to examine my heart this week. I had to examine it today. Prohibitions to examine. Then we looked at practices for the Christian family to employ. We take very seriously the prohibitions in verses 26 through 31, and then we put to work, we put into practice the next three commands that Paul gives us in verse 32. Here's what he says. First of all, he says his command is be kind. That's a novel thought. Be kind to one another. That right there will revolutionize your home. Just be kind to each other. Second of all, he says be compassionate, tenderhearted. You don't relish in the pain and hurt of somebody else. You aren't glad that they failed. You aren't glad that they got in a bind or a tight situation. You aren't glad that something happened to them that was negative. No, you have compassion on them. And then he says be forgiving. We show kindness, we show compassion, and then we practice forgiveness. Forgiving one another, even as in Christ God forgave you. Forgiving theirs in the present tense, remember, it implies a continuous action. Forgiveness is not a one-time event. It's a continuous action. The disciple said, Lord, how often should we forgive our brother who sins against us or offends us? And Jesus said, you forgive him, you forgive them 70 times 7. He's not focusing on, he's not saying 490 times. He, he's talking about the unlimitless forgiveness that we are to give. Unlimited forgiveness. As used here, it means to give freely and unconditionally or bestow as a gift of grace. The example for you and I is Jesus Christ. We need to remember how much we've been forgiven of when we withhold forgiveness from somebody else. We have the power to forgive others because we have been forgiven. When somebody sins against us, we need to remember how much we've sinned against God and how much we've been forgiven for. You see, as a child of God, you're the most forgiven person in all the world. Therefore, you must be the most forgiving person in all the world. So our question was, really, as we close this morning, we asked this question, would you want God to forgive you in the same way you forgive others? I don't. I don't want God to deal with me like that. Forgiveness. To show grace to one who has sinned greatly. You know what that speaks of? It speaks of the undeserved nature of forgiveness. How many times have you ever said this? You know what? This time, they just don't deserve forgiveness. You're exactly right. They don't. You realize that's what forgiveness is, though. Giving them something they don't deserve. It's grace. Christ is our example. So who do you need to forgive in your family? Who do you need to forgive in the church? Who do you need to ask forgiveness from? All right, let's pick up tonight very quickly, very quickly. Give me about 10 minutes, 15 at the most. Notice, notice number three. Here, here's where I want to give you some practical, some practical uh, uh, principles that, that, that will help you in this area of forgiveness. So I want you to write this down. Points to explore for the Christian family. Prohibitions to examine. Uh, points to explore for the Christian family. First of all, write this down. Forgiveness has a price, no doubt about it. Forgiveness has a price. It's costly. Where there's sin, there is a debt. And someone must pay that debt. That is exactly what Jesus Christ did for us. And it's what we're to do for others. There, number two, there's one solution to our sin. One solution to our sin is the act of forgiveness. Number three, why should we forgive? We ought to forgive others because God has forgiven us. You can take payments on the debt owed you, or you can make the final payment and declare the debt canceled. All right, number four, our spiritual health. Our spiritual health. Explore that. There's the direct connection between our spiritual health and our willingness to seek forgiveness and grant grace to those who have sinned against us. 
Hebrews 12, 15, the writer of Hebrews said that believers should see to it that no one misses the grace of God. We don't want to miss the grace of God. And that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and to defile many. You say, is forgiveness really possible? R.T. Kendall, great preacher of days gone by, he tells of a time when somebody very near and dear to him hurt him greatly. And the anger that he felt overwhelmed him. And at length, he talked it over with a faithful friend. And after he poured out all the sordid details of what had been done to him, he paused for a moment, waiting for his friend to say to him, R.T., you're right to feel so angry. What happened to you was awful. I don't blame you for being so angry. I, I, I can't comprehend what happened to you. But that's not what his friend said. You know what he said? After listening to all those details, he simply looked at R.T. Kendall and he said, you must totally forgive him. Kendall was dumbfounded. And so he started to tell the story all over again. This time, he added more details and he left out. And then he was interrupted with words that would change his life. You must totally forgive him. If you'll release him, you'll be the one set free. Oh, think, of, think about that. If you just release him, you'll be the one set free. So, so those are uh, some points to explore. And then let me give you, uh, fourth of all, some problems to evade. Problems to evade. Now, we know from the Word of God that we are supposed to forgive. We know what the Bible says about forgiveness. But when it comes to doing it, a lot of times we have a hard time. And so I want you to be on the lookout for these problems when you're faced with the decision to forgive or not to forgive. Here's the first problem. Number one is excuses. <laughs> Amen. Excuses. Uh, common excuses. You hear it, I hear it. Uh, the size of the herd is too great. Well, listen to me. If the herd is so great, that that's all the more reason to shed it. All the more reason to get rid of it. C.S. Lewis said to be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in us. All right? The size of the herd. That's an excuse. Number two, the fairness of it. The fairness of it. How many times have we said this? You know what? It's not fair. It's not fair for me just to let them off the hook. It's not fair for me just to release that. Listen to me. Forgiveness is not fair, but that's the point of it. You're letting them go. Number three, excuse is the seriousness of of the hurt but you don't know how bad he or she hurt me you don't know about how bad they hurt me listen I've got news for you that's, that, that's really not the issue because your loved one may hurt you again young people your parents may get on your nerves again I, I can promise you they will your sister or brother may cut you down again. Your children may rebel again, but you forgive nonetheless. Forgiveness is how you begin to stop the pain. Another excuse is the perceived solution to the hurt. You know what I've heard? I've heard this many times. Well, you know what? I've been hurt so bad I have to heal first. And then I'll get around to the forgiveness part. Listen, in order to heal, in order to heal, you must forgive. It's a starting point. And then the excuse of forgetting it. I can't forgive if I can't forget. Well, listen to me, you'll never forget it if you don't forgive it. Then number six is the revenge factor. Very simply, I want revenge. Always remember that the Word of God teaches that to the child of God, according to David, to the child of God, God is our avenger. He's our avenger. He takes care of that. So don't get all hung up on revenge. And then number seven is, is letting them off. Why should I let him or her off the hook? L listen, if you're not forgiving someone, it's you that needs to be let off the hook. It's me that needs to be let off the hook. I'm in the prison of my own unforgiveness. I'm in the prison of my own bitterness and my own resentment. It's killing me on the inside and that other person's probably not even thinking about it. 
They're just going along in their life, happy on their merry way. So if anybody needs to be let off the hook, it's me. And then number eight is the time factor. You know what some people say? Well, you know what? This hurt that's been done to me, I'm not going to forgive, you know. I, I don't believe they can be forgiven, but time will heal it. Time will heal it. I, I've changed my mind about time healing everything. I've changed my mind about that. Time doesn't heal everything. They're hurt so deep that, that time just doesn't heal. That's why, listen to me, that's why when you've been offended by somebody or hurt somebody, it's why you try to avoid them when you see them out in public because all the hurt comes back. But listen, the healing begins when forgiveness begins. And then there's the justice factor. You say, you know, if I forgive that person, where's the justice in that? Listen, it's on the cross. Think about the cross. I mean, Jesus released you from the debt of your sins, and as such, we are to release the debt that we think others owe us. Now listen to me now. I don't pretend to know the pain and hurt and betrayal that you've been through and that you feel. Matter of fact, as I talk to folk, in most cases, I cannot even comprehend it. I cannot even imagine some of the scenarios that you have been through. However, here's what I do know. Here's what I do know. The only way to be free is to release people from ever having to pay you back for the wrong they did to you. C.S. Lewis was right. He said, everyone says forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have someone to forgive. Everybody says forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have something to forgive. So the question is, do we want to be right more than we want to be reconciled? Colossians 3.13, Paul's clear that forgiveness is a must. As the Lord hath forgiven you, so you must also forgive others. Many of you read books by Nancy Lee DeMoss. Some of you ladies do. In her book, Choosing Forgiveness, she said this, Whatever sin has been committed against you, the choice not to forgive is itself a serious sin. In fact, failing to forgive can often bring about problems in your life far worse and more long-term than the pain of the original offense. Now listen, just because we forgive, it doesn't mean that we can immediately and automatically rid our mind of the wrong done to us. Forgiveness just means that we release the debt. It's a deliberate decision to let it go. So if you're having a hard time forgiving, maybe it's because you're still dwelling on the deeds that have been done to you. Corey Ten Boom, I talked about her last week. She survived the Holocaust. And she received from helpful advice from a pastor when she was bitter over what some Christian friends had done to her. After two sleepless weeks, her pastor told her, up in the church tower is a bell which is rung by pulling on a rope. When that rope is pulled, the bell sounds out. Ding dong, ding dong, ding dong. But if the rope is not pulled, the sound slowly fades away. Forgiveness is like that. When we forgive someone, we take our hand off the rope. But if we've been tugging at our grievances a long time, we mustn't be surprised if the old angry thoughts keep coming for a while. They're just ding-dongs of the old bell slowing down. Now, I wonder tonight, symbolically, are we still yanking on that rope or have we truly let it go? Well, we got a couple of choices. We can keep ringing the bell or we can let it go. We can keep on ringing it, bringing it back up, or we can let it go. What are we going to do tonight? We have those two choices. Just suppose, and I want you to get a picture of this. I wish I'd have thought about it and, and picked up some little bells that we could ring. But just suppose you had a little bell in your hand right now. And that bell represents a wrong that's been done to you. You now have a choice to make. You can keep ringing that bell or you can take your hand off the rope. You can let it go. There, there comes a time. There comes a time for forgiveness. And maybe tonight, for some of us, that time is right now. Time to let it go. It, it all starts with a decision. Remember, forgiveness is an action, not an emotion. It's not a feeling. 
who do you need to forgive in your family? A spouse? A parent? A child? A sibling? A grandparent? Maybe an uncle? Maybe an aunt? Maybe a cousin? Anybody else that's on your mind? Let it go. Stop ringing the bell. Forgive them. As we conclude, let's, let's look about practicing forgiveness. Simple things about practicing forgiveness. Uh, forgiveness, remember, is not optional in the Christian life. It's not optional. It, it's a command. Forgiveness is at the heart of what it means to be a practicing Christian. So here's some helpful tips. Number one, quit keeping score. Quit keeping score. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 5, we re read it last week. Love keeps no record of wrongs done. Number two, forgiveness should be fostered in our homes. It ought to be, we ought to have a culture of forgiveness among our family. You know what you say? Instead of saying, I'm sorry, you say, I was wrong, please forgive me. Now there's a stark contrast between the two. When you wrong your spouse, you ask him or her for forgiveness. Don't just feel bad about what you did or offer an easy, I'm sorry. Sometimes... That I'm sorry is so easy that it's the easy way out. It gets a little more difficult when we say, I was wrong, I sinned against you, will you forgive me? Sometimes apologizing is the world's substitute for forgiving. Because there's not a single reference to apologizing in the Word of God. I learned that this week. Not a single reference. Our kids ought to be taught to admit to others that they were wrong in actions, in words, and in attitudes. I was wrong. I sinned against you. Would you please forgive me? Now listen to me. If somebody says that to you, don't downplay it. Somebody comes to you and says that, don't downplay it. It is a big deal. Don't dismiss it. It's okay to say, you know what? You did hurt me. You were wrong. I was hurt, but I forgive you. But don't, don't downplay it. Because it is serious. Now here's a hard one. If someone has sinned against you, release him or her from ever having to pay you back. I'll give you a little help on this one. And this is good for all of us. You've been hurt. You've been sinned against. On a piece of paper, maybe tonight or this week, Write down the names of those who've sinned against you. Next to their name, write down what they've done. In the third column, write out how you're going to respond and then forgive them. Just forgive them. And then go to your bathroom, wipe that paper up, throw it in the toilet, and flush it away. You don't have to feel like it. You don't have to want to do it. Just do it. Forgiveness is an action not a feeling. You've got to forgive the past in order to live in the present. And some of you know what I'm talking about. You've got to forgive the past to truly live in the present. Some, sometimes we say, I can't forgive. But you know what? A lot of times that means really what we're saying is, I won't forgive. So here's what it all boils down to. In order to be obedient to God and His Word, I must practice forgiveness pastor by the name of Brian Bill made this statement. He said, if you find yourself praying something like this, Lord, help me forgive so and so, and you don't feel like you're getting in anywhere, instead of praying for yourself, try praying for the person who wronged you. Pray for them. Pray God would do a work in their life. Pray God would change their life. Pray God would bless them. Take care of them. Memorize Ephesians 4.32. It's the fourth thing, fourth tip. Memorize Ephesians 4.32 and tell your family that you're going to put it into practice this week. I told you this morning that marriages, homes, and the church are made up of sinners. Listen to me. The home also made, ought to be made up of forgivers. Good forgivers. Number five, practice the four promises of forgiveness. Say, what are they, preacher? Well, according to Ken Sand, he says this. Number one, first promise of forgiveness. Number one, I refuse to dwell on this incident. I refuse to dwell on it. Number two, 
I refuse to bring up this incident again and use it against you. I see some of you writing these down, so I'm going to go slow. I refuse to bring up this incident again and use it against you. The third promise of forgiveness is, listen to this, I refuse to talk to others about this incident or I refuse to talk about the offender in a negative way. That's hard. That's hard for me. I got to work on that one. And then the fourth promise of forgiveness is this. I refuse to let this incident Stand between us or hinder our personal relationship. Between us or hinder our personal relationship. Or you could say, I refuse to let this incident stand between me and the Lord in our personal relationship. James McDonald said, I won't bring the offense up to myself. Think about that. I won't bring the offense up to myself. I'll not go over it and think about and dwell on it. I'm forgiven and I'm free. Listen to me, friend. That is exactly what God has done for us. He does not dwell on our sin. He washes it away. He does not bring up our sin against us. He forgives and he forgets. He refuses to let the incident stand between him and me. He's ready to forgive me. That's exactly what God does for us and it's what He calls us to do for others. And then, number six, make sure that you've experienced forgiveness, forgiveness from God yourself. Here's our money statement this week. We had one last week. Here's our money statement for this week. We will forgive to the extent that we appreciate how much we've been forgiven. Now I'm going to say that again so you can write it down. We will forgive to the extent that we appreciate how much we've been forgiven. Jesus said something like this in Luke 7, 47. He said, He who has been forgiven little loves little. You can't forgive others properly though until you yourself have experienced the grace and forgiveness of Almighty God. You, you, you can't do it. Do you want to strengthen your family? You want to strengthen your relationships? Then focus on forgiveness. Practice forgiveness. Give forgiveness. Be kind. Show compassion. Be kind in the home. Show compassion in the home. Practice forgiveness in the home. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Tonight, could I ask you, first of all, have you received forgiveness from God yourself? Have you received that forgiveness that leads to salvation? Have you been saved tonight? Do you know Jesus as your personal Savior?